Chapter Seven of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: A Sunday in Philadelphia. I did not think it out myself," said Caroline, with a flush on her cheek. "My brother Ben and I were talking about the boys in the printing office being obliged to do Sunday work, and some of us said the boys wouldn't go to church if they had a chance." so it did not make any difference about their having to work on sunday and my brother said we had nothing to do with that part of it that our business was to give them a chance and then if they did not go we wouldn't be the ones to blame just so said the conductor with an approving nod that brother of yours has a clear head on his shoulders i wouldn't mind working for him when he gets to be a man well there's lots of car travelling done on sundays by them that you wouldn't think would do such things why there are two or three ministers who come in on the cars regularly every sunday to their churches that's a fact he added in response to caroline's astonished look i know them myself and meet them very often have you been to church today one of them said to me not long ago no sir i haven't i said I have been too busy getting the preachers there and getting them home again to take time to go myself. He laughed as though he thought it was a good joke. Then he sobered up and said he, Don't you really get a chance to go at all? That is too bad. Well, said I, if folks wouldn't travel on Sundays, folks wouldn't have to work to travel them. He laughed again and said he, There's some truth in that but some people are situated so they have to travel on sundays see how it is with me i live fifteen miles from my church how could i get to it if it were not for the train i suppose you would have to live nearer your church said i he shook his head and says he i cannot do that very well i have an invalid daughter who has to live in the country i couldn't help asking one question said i doctor what would you have done if you had lived before railroads were invented well he laughed again and that was the end of it i like folks to be honest i'd have thought more of that minister if he had said i believe in sunday cars they are convenient and comfortable and i like to use them here we are he added giving a sharp pull to the bell as they were nearing a street crossing there followed another brisk walk through streets less filled with people and at last the conductor halted before a neat quiet-looking house this is home he said cheerily now for some breakfast caroline followed him timidly into a room at the end of the hall where stood a tall pale woman with her hair combed straight back in an unbecoming way she had a child in her arms and two more were clinging to her skirts one of them crying wearily as though she were simply crying because she did not know what else to do well said the woman turning as the door opened have you got home at last you are late yes said caroline's friend we were pretty late getting in this morning but we are here now and glad enough this little woman and i are to be here hungry as bears we are too hello babies how are you all and he patted one on the head stooped to kiss the other and held out his hands for the baby the woman meantime looked her astonishment at caroline while she talked to her husband they are all as fretful as they can be she said resigning the baby i have had a dreadful time getting breakfast they have all stuck to me like burrs and cried every time i stirred out of their sight john who have you here sure enough he said whirling around i didn't introduce you did i here is little miss bryant i declare i don't know what your first name is it was given in a very low and somewhat tremulous voice oh yes caroline bryant that is her name mother and she has come a journey without intending it she got started on the wrong train last night and instead of getting home at seven in the evening as she had planned she slept through and got to this city by daylight that's the story in a nutshell i brought her home with me to stay until the ten o'clock train tomorrow morning mercy said the woman 
and caroline could not help wondering just what the exclamation meant was her hostess shocked with her appearance or dismayed because she would have to keep her overnight the poor girl could not wonder at the dismay when she looked down at herself and realized that the dress which had gone a nutting and a waiting in the swift running stream was actually the one in which she was making a sunday morning appearance in philadelphia it really seemed due to her that some explanation of her condition be made at once we had been nutting she said my brother and some friends and i when we reached the station my brother was sent on an errand and the others went to take a walk and i got into the right train i thought and fell asleep and did not waken until morning i had had a fright and tore my dress and got it wet and my head ached so badly i hardly knew what i did humph said the woman you must have made trouble enough at home if you have a home this was almost too much for poor caroline she struggled with the lump in her throat which she supposed she had conquered some time before but which was there now larger than ever yes um she said faintly i have a home and a mother i don't know what mother will do mother is all right long ago the conductor said cheerily and he cast a reproachful look at his wife i wired her as soon as we reached the city she is planning by this time how to meet you to-morrow see here kit don't pull papa's hair all out and he tried to turn the attention on the baby the woman only apparently half satisfied turned away and began to dish up the breakfast it was after caroline had eaten the little bit which she could coax herself to swallow and retired to the farther end of the room to look out of the window and wipe the tears away unseen that she heard the conductor's wife say that is rather a queer story isn't it which she tells what became of the rest of her folks who went nutting did they all go to sleep and if they didn't why didn't they look after her i don't know what became of the others i'm sure the conductor said taking large mouthfuls of bread and butter but i know this party is all right she is a very interesting little girl i had to bring her home there wasn't anything else to do she will amuse the children i guess and so help you a little hm said his wife mrs prescott smith was on the train he said between the bites of beef steak and took quite a fancy to her she stayed with her in the station while i went to telegraph why didn't mrs prescott smith take her home with her the wife asked she would have liked to only their house is closed they stay at the hotel over sunday well i suppose there was room in the hotel for another one i suppose she thought a hotel wasn't a nice place to take a strange little girl to who wasn't rigged up for travelling she had been nutting all day you see i suppose she was very glad not to be bothered with other people's business said his wife oh i don't know about that mrs smith is a benevolent woman humph she is benevolent with other people's things i never heard that she was with her own particularly she will send her second girl to help wash the dishes after a sociable but then the girl has to wash her own dishes all the same and doesn't get a cent more wages for doing extra work she told me so i call that the girl's benevolence and not mrs smith's her husband laughed oh well he said she has her weak places i suppose but there are worse people in the world than mrs prescott smith yes and better people some of them would have taken a strange girl home with them instead of letting a poor man like you bear the burden at this point caroline came forward her tears were dried and she felt that she could not endure the sound of another word if you please she said speaking rapidly and excitedly is there not some place where i can go and stay until to-morrow morning somewhere where i will not be in the way my mother will pay the people for keeping me i know she will and i want very much to go the conductor gave his wife the most reproachful look she had ever received from him and hastened to say why my girl what do you mean i tell you you are welcome here 
just as welcome as possible we are glad to have you see how quiet and good the children have been ever since they have had you to look at make yourself easy and be as happy as you can the day will pass before you know it it is passing pretty fast for me and i am getting no sleep out of it i have night work to-night too and he arose and whistling softly left the room you must not mind what you heard me say child the woman said not unkindly i speak right out whatever happens to be in my mind but i don't mean any harm you are welcome to be here i'm sure i'm very sorry to be here ma'am said caroline it was very kind in your husband to bring me but oh i would so much rather be at home and now the tears chased themselves rapidly down her face there there don't cry it is hard on you that's a fact when you didn't plan it or nothing what became of all the rest of them and then caroline told as steadily and as clearly as she could the whole queer little story and finished with what became of rufus and fanny kedwin i can't think i can said mrs brinker sagely i begin to understand it you all got on the wrong train then they got out for something and came back and got on the right one at the last minute maybe and you stayed on the wrong one and came to philadelphia it is too bad i am real sorry for you but you must make the best of it and think how soon tomorrow morning will be here her voice had grown very kind and comforting and caroline dried her eyes and offered to help wash the dishes i can do them alone if you will trust me she said i wash them at home for mother every day you do go about it in a business-like way that's a fact said mrs brinker watching the swift moving fingers with admiring eyes i reckon your mother understands how to work and has taught you well i don't mind leaving them to you i'm sure if you would just as soon though it is so queer to me to have any help that i hardly know how to act i often think about the time when my daisy will begin to help me but my children so far only know how to hinder and they are master hands at that is her name daisy said caroline catching her breath and turning quickly to look at the yellow-haired mouse of a girl who kept close to her mother and looked pale and tired the queer lump which had been threatening all the morning to choke caroline now arose in her throat again and she struggled with the tears which wanted to drop into the dishwater as she said with lips which quivered that is my little sister's name you don't say said mrs brinker with instant appreciation and sympathy and she is a little pet of yours i dare say my how glad she will be to see you to-morrow it was a masterly sentence turning the current of caroline's thoughts from the distressing present to the rose-colored to-morrow and making her resolve once more to be womanly and bear her trouble in silence and helpfulness it was a busy morning which was a great comfort in its way to have folded her hands and done nothing would have been almost too much for caroline mrs brinker availed herself of the opportunity while her dishes were being washed for her to wash and dress the baby and cuddle him to sleep then she hurried about the little room making it neat and cheery looking what can i do now caroline asked as having carefully washed and rinsed her drying towel and dishcloth she hung them in the corner where her quick eye saw that they probably belonged she waited before the lady of the house for her reply i declare for it said that good woman admiringly you are just as neat as wax and no mistake it shows what kind of a mother you've got i wonder if my daisy will ever show her bringing up as plain as you do well i guess you are tired enough to sit down a spell or maybe you would like to take a little walk for me out to the grocery it is just a few steps beyond the corner then catching the dismayed look on caroline's face and mistaking its cause she made haste to say perhaps you would best not you might take the wrong turn being unused to the city and get lost and that would be just dreadful 
i'm sure your mother would never forgive me if i risked it nor brinker either for that matter i'm not afraid of getting lost said caroline with a glow on her cheeks i can generally find my way but ma'am i thought you had forgotten that it was sunday oh said mrs brinker no i had not forgotten you ain't used to seeing stores open on sunday i s'pose they don't keep open here the best of em and i don't make a practice of buying things on sunday but there is a little corner grocery just for the convenience of folks who live away out here and i sometimes slip in at the back door and get one or two forgotten things i'm making a soup for our sunday dinner and i forgot every breath about a carrot or an onion and soup isn't worth much without those two things in it you know if you will look after the children a little i'll just slip down there and get a couple i always contrive to have a good dinner on sunday if i don't do much the rest of the week it is the only day he is at home to eat with us i'll take bubby along with me because he's so terrible shy that like enough he would cry and worry you out of your wits but daisy will like to get acquainted with you i guess daisy is mother's little woman generally though she does act uncommon fretty this morning i'll say that for her caroline said no more it is true she had been brought up to believe that keeping the sabbath day holy was of much more consequence than carrots or onions but she had also been brought up to understand that she must not interfere with the movements of others whom she had no right to control so she coaxed the fair-haired daisy who looked very unlike her own darling by that name to a seat on her lap in the great armchair in the corner and began a story to entertain her while bubby stumped away beside his mother i'll tell you a sunday-school lesson story she said because this is sunday you know and a great many little girls and boys are in sunday school don't you ever go daisy shook her head when i get a big girl i'm going she explained and i'm going to take bubby and the baby i can't go now because mother can't leave the baby to take me and i'm too little to find my way alone and father has to sleep sundays poor little mouse what a revelation of life it was to caroline sunday the blessed day of the week to them her mother's day of leisure and privilege and to this family it meant simply a chance for father to sleep and for the mother to get up an extra dinner caroline was not a christian and she had not known how precious and important the sabbath services were to her until this day when she was shut away from them well she said after a moment's thought we will have a little sunday school all by ourselves at least we will have the lesson story do you know about lazarus daisy nodded excitedly do you mean tommy lazarus down by pike lane he is a bad wicked jew boy he froed stones at bubby and me one day when we wasn't doing nothing at all only just standing and looking at him and his father whipped him for it too oh no said caroline much shocked what would daisy bryant have thought of such ignorance as this i mean the lazarus whose story is in the big bible he lived in bethany and had two sisters named mary and martha do you know about him no said daisy was he a jew boy and did he throw stones if he did i hate him and why did his sisters both have two names just the same their names were not the same said puzzled caroline why do you think they were cause you said so you said they was both named mary martha i've got a cousin in new york named mary martha but her sister's name is hannah jane oh no said caroline laughing for the first time since she had discovered herself to be on the way to philadelphia and beginning to understand that she must frame her sentences more carefully i did not mean to have you understand it so i mean that the two sisters were named one mary and the other martha lazarus was their grown-up brother and he was good and they loved him jesus loved him too you know jesus don't you daisy nodded 
he is god and lives in heaven she said in a grave tone yes but he used to live on earth he used to come and see this family in bethany very often and he loved them all one day lazarus was taken sick he kept growing worse until at last his sisters sent for jesus to come and see him then they waited and watched but he did not come and at last lazarus died my little brother died daisy volunteered at this point and they put him in a box and dug a hole in the ground and put him in i hated them when they did that oh no said caroline you must not feel so it was only his body you know that was put in the ground little brother's soul went to live with jesus in heaven the sisters had lazarus buried in a grave and they cried and mourned very much because he was gone why didn't jesus come when they sent for him demanded the listener they did not know they could not understand why he should stay away when he loved lazarus so much but one day four days after their brother was put into the grave they were sitting with some friends who had come to tell them how sorry they were for them when some one brought word that jesus was coming along the road which led to the village humph said this little skeptic great good in his coming then i wouldn't have said a word to him i would have been so mad to think he did not come when i wanted him End of chapter seven chapter eight of twenty minutes late by pansy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. Night Work For a moment Caroline was silent. She felt greatly shocked over such words as these from almost baby lips. It was so utterly different from her own little Daisy's manner of speech. She rallied, however, remembering how little opportunity this Daisy had to learn, and said earnestly, That would have been a naughty way to feel, because you told me remember that jesus was god and of course he knew just when to come and he always does what is right martha went out as quickly as she could to meet him and in a few minutes she went back for mary and told her jesus wanted to see her the friends who were calling on her when they saw mary hurry away decided that she had gone to her brother's grave and they followed to try to comfort her so pretty soon they all stood by the grave it was not like the graves in our cemeteries but was more like a little stone house with a door and a great stone rolled against it jesus told them to take away the stone and this frightened martha she did not want to see her dead brother she began to explain to jesus how dreadful it would be and he told her that her brother should live again she did not understand what he meant and the plainer he spoke to her the more she did not understand until suddenly he turned to the grave and said speaking in a loud voice lazarus come forth and that dead man heard him and came out of the grave oh oh said daisy her eyes large and her voice grave and reproachful you didn't ought to tell wicked stories dead folks can't hear and they can't walk nor move nor nothing they can hear one voice said caroline earnestly when jesus speaks even dead men hear and obey him daisy looked grave and skeptical are you sure this is a true story she asked oh yes said caroline it is every word true it is in the bible you know and god told people what to write in the bible daisy gave a long sigh and said sorrowfully i just wish jesus had been here when my little brother died i called him and called him and he wouldn't answer at all and mother said he couldn't he will some day said caroline confidently jesus will call his body out of the grave and he will rise up just as lazarus did the conversation was interrupted by the return of mrs brinker from the corner grocery with her carrots and onions preparations for the dinner now went on briskly it was an excellent dinner 
caroline who had never in her own home seen such a bustle of preparation for a sunday dinner could not help enjoying it heartily for by the time it was ready she was very hungry the little she had eaten at breakfast time having long since been digested it was not a very quiet meal the baby awoke at just the wrong moment feeling very cross and unhappy and bubby clung to his mother's dress and wanted to be held and petted as much as the baby did but at last he was persuaded to go to sleep and the baby too dropped off into another doze so quiet was restored mrs brinker chose the opportunity to propose her plan it is dreadful dull for you staying in the house all day don't you want him to take you for a walk it will be your only chance to see the city caroline's face flushed and for a moment she hardly knew what to say especially as the conductor was looking at her in a very earnest expectant way oh no i thank you she stammered i would much rather stay here and help you but the kind-hearted woman urged her scheme i don't need a bit of help she said you helped me so much this morning that i'm not half so tired as usual and now bubby and the baby are both asleep my little one here will help mother it is a shame for you to come all the way to philadelphia and not see any of it don't you say so brinker why don't you urge her to go you can take her as well as not can't you i'll take her in a jiffy if she says so declared mr brinker and like nothing better than to see her eyes when i show her the sights but i don't want to urge her against her will she has ideas has this young woman mother some way this sentence helped caroline to speak out her real reason for declining the walk if you please mrs brinker mother never likes us to take walks on sunday so we never go when we are at home oh said mrs brinker looking astonished is that so why what harm can it do to walk quietly along a street minding your own business it seems to me a nice quiet way of spending sunday enough sight better than a great many ways i know of but then of course you don't want to do anything that your mother doesn't like being you are away from her i know just how you feel well i'll tell you brinker might take you to the three o'clock sunday school it is but little more than time and is not far from here they sing beautifully i have promised daisy and bubby they shall go as soon as ever baby is old enough to be taken along you would like that now wouldn't you poor caroline looked down at her torn and soiled dress in dismay it seemed rude to refuse such well-meant kindness but how was it possible for a neat girl like her who never appeared in the streets of her own town in other than a very tasteful dress to go to sunday school in a great city in a dress which had been nutting the day before to say nothing of the many disasters it had met with as she looked down at herself she decided that it really was not to be thought of oh i cannot she said desperately look at my dress it is torn and soiled and it is not my sunday dress even at home it would not be decent to go to sunday school in such a plight you look enough sight better than plenty who will be there said mrs brinker significantly it is a mission school you know and they do not pay much attention to clothes lots of them don't but then they are not your sort well i don't see but what you will have to stay in the house all day then oh yes said caroline relieved i can as well as not then a bright thought came to her mrs brinker could not you and mr brinker go to sunday school i can do the dishes i will make everything nice and daisy and i can take care of the children i am sure husband and wife exchanged glances and mrs brinker laughed a sort of shy laugh her cheeks growing almost as red as caroline's brinker and i haven't been to sunday school for a dozen years at least she said we wouldn't know how to act would we john not but what i'd like a breath of fresh air well enough and the queerness of taking a walk with him and without any children to look after would be something to remember all right said mr brinker briskly let's go 
i don't mind going to sunday school again i used to like it right well when i was a youngster get on your things molly and let's try it she will manage the work and the youngsters too i haven't a doubt she's a wide awake capable young woman i saw that this morning as soon as i began to talk with her they walked away at last great satisfaction visible on the conductor's face and the two who were left in charge began a vigorous attack on the dishes it was a very easy matter to dispose of those caroline was perfectly at home with dishes and really enjoyed reducing everything to perfect order giving object lessons to little daisy at the same time as to the best ways of working it was another matter when baby awoke and despite everything the two could do or say screamed himself hoarse i never knew him to be so naughty said daisy with a grave face it can't be because he is afraid he isn't half so afraid of folks as bubby is what do you suppose makes his cheeks so red is it because he cried so hard it may be said caroline anxiously but i'm afraid it is because he has a fever oh dear said daisy mother is always scared when any of us have a fever because it is what ailed little brother when he died isn't it most time for mother to come i think so said caroline moving the baby from one shoulder to the other and trying every device she could think of to quiet him never mind daisy she said between the screams trying to smile on the troubled little girl babies often have a little fever when they are cutting their teeth and it doesn't make them sick only uncomfortable certainly if this baby was uncomfortable he did his best to make them so and succeeded by the time daisy who after vainly trying to get his attention had retired to the window called out joyfully here they come caroline was thoroughly tired and a little alarmed she had had some experience with sick children and was afraid this baby was sick mercy's sake said mrs brinker bustling in what is the matter with baby how he does cry though has he been going on like this ever since i've been gone dear heart mother ought to have known better than to leave him and he getting two great double teeth daisy child why didn't you try to amuse him i did said daisy coming forward i played peek and bow wow and everything and he wouldn't notice at all and she says she guesses he has a fever what said mrs brinker alarmed in an instant and almost throwing her bonnet in her haste to get the baby into her arms poor little fellow she said as the weary child laid his tired head on her shoulder and hushed his cries into low sobs he has got a fever john as sure as the world oh dear me i hope he's not going to be sick and you going out to-night too why a fever is not anything to be scared at when a baby is teething said the father and mrs brinker assented to this but declared that he had not been like himself all day and i don't know what to make of bubby either she said he never sleeps all day like this he's been asleep the biggest part of the day but then he was wakeful in the night and i suppose he's making up oh yes said the father he's all right i guess only tired out in this way father and mother tried to reassure each other and succeeded as for the baby he seemed to have found what he wanted the minute his head touched his mother's shoulder he dozed off to sleep again merely giving struggling little sobs occasionally as a reminder of the sea of troubles through which he had come poor little fellow said mrs brinker i ought not to have left him i never do but then i don't get a chance it was most dreadful nice and that's a fact i haven't been out walking with john before in i don't know when three are so many to take for decent people who don't go pleasuring on sunday that is the only day we have and only a piece of that he has got to go out to-night at six o'clock he doesn't generally have to go sunday nights 
but this is extra work because some of the men are sick i wish he didn't have to go to-night i declare it is going on to five now isn't it how fast this afternoon has gone well we've had a lovely time we went to the sunday school and the singing was just heavenly they gave us a book and john sang with the best of them he's a fine singer my husband is Sho said the husband from a distant corner where he was struggling with a pair of boots which were rather small that will do for you to say it's true for all that said the woman in an admiring tone if i do say it that shouldn't i'm glad i have a chance to hear your voice once more if i don't go again till baby is old enough to walk there between us i'll remember this day john as soon as ever i can get this baby sound enough to put down i'll make you a cup of tea to hearten you up for to-night on hearing this caroline was on the alert mr brinker protested that he did not think it was necessary that he had eaten a good dinner and plenty of it nevertheless he did justice to the supper which was presently ready for him and went away at last in haste declaring that no day was ever so short before i'll be home in time for the ten o'clock run little woman he said to caroline never you fear i get in at daylight and have three good hours before my train goes out good-bye all of you sleep hearty and dream of to-morrow i won't run the risk of waking bubby by kissing him for fear you'll have him on your hands before you're ready for him caroline was once more washing the dishes and mrs brinker was trying to hush the baby who showed a constant tendency to moan and cry when bubby awoke coughing and crying arousing the baby to screams again and for the next hour there were trying times dear dear said mrs brinker as she turned from the baby who had at last allowed her to lay him down to feel of bubby's flushed cheeks for he too had at last been quieted i don't know what is the matter i'm sure bubby is in quite a fever too and he never goes on like this he must be sick he hasn't any teeth coming in to lay it to and he doesn't up and have a fever over the least little thing as some children do i'm just afraid he is real sick and the baby too i never did see them both cut up like this unless something was the matter i wish i hadn't let brinker go but there i couldn't have helped myself if i had wanted to that is the trouble with railroad men they've got to go just at the minute no matter what is happening at home but i would give a dollar if he was here now what would he do asked caroline gravely for she too felt a heavy responsibility resting upon her the more she looked at baby in his heavy sleep and saw his fever-flushed face and remembered his heavy eyes the more sure she felt that the mother was right and the child was going to be sick why i'd advise with him about sending for the doctor said the mother anxiously we don't send for him every other hitch as some do it counts up so and i'm not a nervous woman and know how to take care of children but ever since our little boy died i've been anxious over a fever he died with fever you see and some way i seem to feel that if brinker were here now he would advise that we have the doctor look in and see if there was anything to worry about where does the doctor live mrs brinker why quite a piece from here and i don't know how i'd get him i'm sure if i made up my mind for my neighbor who does errands for me sometimes is gone away down town to a meeting to-night the whole of them went and locked up their house they told me they were going when i came home and they were to take the half-past six car so they are gone and there isn't anybody else couldn't i go why you don't know the way though to be sure it is just a straight road with only one turn but then folks take the wrong turn in a strange place sometimes in broad daylight and if anything should happen to you i'd never forgive myself let alone being forgiven by your mother there won't anything happen to me said caroline rising to the occasion it is too early in the evening to be afraid 
and my mother always told me to do what looked as though it ought to be done if i could i can keep a straight road and take one turn i should hope please tell me just how to go mrs brinker and i will try it i don't like to have you said mrs brinker going to the window and looking out it isn't dark to be sure she said with the street lamps all lighted and there are policemen pretty thick up this way but then to be out in a big city at seven o'clock and after for a little strange girl from the country is almost too much i might send daisy with you only she has a cold and is hoarse she knows exactly where the doctor lives but she gets cold awful easy it would not do for her to go said caroline i know i can find my way mrs brinker and i know mother would want me to try when there was such an errand as this to be done well said mrs brinker coming back from another look at baby's face and an attempt to feel the bounding pulse at his wrist which did not serve to comfort her i don't know what to make of baby's having such a fever and that's a fact and i'd like dreadful well to have the doctor step in because when little ruby was sick he said mrs brinker you lost twenty-four valuable hours before you sent for me those were the very words he said and i never forgot them for nights after ruby died i'd lie awake and all i could seem to think or try to say were those words you have lost twenty-four valuable hours but maybe we better wait a little and see how things look and if baby isn't better after a while why then if you are a mind to try it i'll tell you exactly where dr forsythe lives that would only be losing some more time said caroline besides it will be getting later all the while i think mrs brinker i would better go right away the baby looks to me as though he needed some medicine while she spoke she fastened her hat and took her sack down from its hook behind the door mrs brinker drew a long sigh partly of anxiety and partly of relief as she said well if you do it i suppose it cannot be helped though i don't know what brinker will say to my allowing it but for the matter of that i don't know what he would say to the baby being sick and me not having a doctor i'll tell you just exactly where he lives and you cannot miss it if you try a few minutes more and caroline her heart beating hard and fast was alone on the streets of the great city what would ben think of that and oh above all what would her mother say if she knew it end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine Waiting. Do you remember where we left Ben Bryant and Mr. Holden? Actually, that long, long night wore away, and the gray dawn of the early Sabbath morning stole over the world without their having been able to find the right person to give them a clue to the possible whereabouts of the one they sought. The nearest approach to it had been the confident statement of one of the train switchmen. Depend upon it, she got on to the wrong train somehow. I don't know how they do it, but they do such things sometimes, and you can't make head nor tail to it. How they could have done it, nor what they did anyhow, but it all comes out right in the end. It was this faint hope which brought both Ben and the minister to the station again, just as the morning was breaking, with a faint idea of telegraphing somewhere to learn about possible mistakes in trains. Ben had been home to see how Daisy was doing, and had said everything comforting he could to his mother, taking pains to explain to her how many people had said that of course Line was safe somewhere, because it simply was not possible that anything very terrible could have happened to her in so short a time and his mother white to her very lips had yet smiled on him and told him he was a brave faithful boy and her comfort then had said earnestly we must pray ben pray as we never have before it is our only refuge then ben almost choking to keep back his tears 
had rushed out again into the night but before joining mr holden he had gone around to the little shed where they kept wood and coal and bowing there in the darkness had prayed as he felt sure he never prayed before a little later he stood beside mr holden listening while that gentleman asked questions of the telegraph operator your best plan will be to wait until the morning express comes in from elizabeth town explained that official the men who come in then are regular railroad hands and know all that goes on if there was any mixing up of trains last night they can tell you all about them and they will know the conductors of the different trains and where to reach them it will be along in thirty minutes i don't see anything for you but to wait until then waiting is the hardest part of what we have had to do all night isn't it ben my boy said mr holden turning with a sympathizing smile and resting his hand on the boy's shoulder some way the kindly act and word seemed to take away every vestige of ben's self-control he had never fainted in his life but the room began to swim about in a strange fashion and if he had not clutched one of the pillars which supported the building he would have fallen to the floor as it was he struggled and swallowed and told himself that he would not fall and he would get over this dizziness without letting anybody know about it he was a miserable baby not fit to be trusted to take care of his mother and the thought of his mother brought back the blood to its place and its duty in a minute or two more he was able to turn and ask almost in a natural tone of voice what time is it now mr holden and mr holden drew his watch and carefully noted the time as though ben had a chronometer which needed regulating at that moment it was just at that moment that the telegraph operator said mr holden this way if you please mr holden and ben started as though it had been one pair of feet that bore them both what is it said mr holden nothing sir said the operator eyeing ben anxiously only there is a dispatch coming for mrs bryant this in a lower tone intended only for the minister's ears give it to me at once said ben in a voice that he did not recognize as his own and mr holden said quietly we keep nothing from ben mr west he is his mother's dependence and then ben knew he must bear whatever was coming for his mother's sake hurrah said the operator with sudden change of voice listen to this little girl safe took wrong train will be in on the ten o'clock run from this city what city said mr holden as ben leaned against the pillar again for support the dispatch is dated at philadelphia and sent by the conductor of number eleven caroline must have made connection with his train somehow i don't understand it but when the morning express gets in the conductor can tell you how it was it was a strange sunday for the first time in their remembrance none of the bryant family went to church daisy was still hoarse and mrs bryant was too anxious to leave her as well as too weary from her night's vigil to attend as for ben he felt sure he could not sit still and at the same time keep awake you ought not to try to keep awake the mother said compassionately as she looked at his haggard face poor boy a night's watching and anxiety have told upon you never mind said ben everything is all right line will be home to-morrow just to think of her being in philadelphia mother do you suppose she will go to church mrs bryant shook her head you forget what dress and hat she has my son sure enough and her dress was torn and soiled but then i believe if i were there in this jacket and trousers i should go caroline will not said her mother positively and i cannot blame her she has at least been able always to be neat in her dress ben at his mother's suggestion took a long nap then took his turn in caring for an interesting daisy 
and they all occupied themselves more or less with questions such as these i wonder what line is doing now where do you think she can be staying all day do you suppose she is very lonesome on the whole they were all glad when the day was done and they could retire to rest saying to themselves as they closed their eyes caroline will be here to-morrow it isn't as though i had sent her away on a visit with everything about her in order and comfortable mrs bryant told herself as she rested her weary head on her pillow it is the unnaturalness of the whole thing and the terrible suspense connected with it what a night it was and she shuddered over the mere thought of it and felt as though when once her mother arms were closed about her darling she would never let her go away from them again monday was easier the necessity for working all day which was upon them made the time pass more rapidly by five o'clock in the afternoon mrs bryant and daisy were dressed for the station and waiting for ben i am so glad i am well enough to go daisy said gleefully mother it is real good that i didn't get very sick isn't it it would have been so hard for line not to see me as soon as she got off the train yes indeed said mrs bryant stooping to kiss her fair little daughter we have a great deal to be thankful for if line had found you coughing and feverish it would have been very hard for her i am afraid she has worried a great deal about you you are so liable to take a severe cold when you get your feet wet it seems like a special providence that you escaped then came ben in hot haste hurry up mother please he said breathlessly we shall have to walk briskly to be in time for the train it seemed as though i was never going to get away everybody wanted something extra however they arrived at the station ten minutes before the train was due and learned that it was fifteen minutes late never mind said ben to daisy's disappointed look twenty-five minutes isn't long to wait think of hours and hours that is where i stood when the man was telling mr holden all about he didn't know what might have happened some of the things seemed hard i had to lean against the pillars to keep me from tumbling over i was so scared at my own thoughts then i went and stood outside in the cold and leaned against the door some of the time i couldn't breathe inside oh it was a night to remember for a good while poor ben said daisy pityingly mother and i had a hard time too i felt so sorry for mother you can't think some of the time i couldn't decide whether it would be better to be hoarse and cough and so give her something real hard to think about and keep her from wondering about line or whether it would be better to be real well and not give her an anxious hour ben broke into a merry laugh could you arrange to do whichever you decided would be best for mother he asked why no said daisy slowly of course not only i could keep back the cough a little you know and not talk to show i was hoarse or i could cough and let her think about that for a while and i didn't know which was best and which did you do daisy it was as perplexing a situation as i ever heard of why at last i decided to be just myself and not try to make believe anything and ask god to help her bear it all that was a wise little woman said ben unable to resist kissing the somewhat pale cheek of his darling even though they were in the station and several people were looking at them there comes mr holden said daisy as the door opened for the twentieth time since they stood there i wonder if he has come to meet line it appeared that he had he came over to them and shook hands all around and asked particularly after daisy telling her she was the most sensible little woman he knew to decide to get well and be on hand to welcome her sister home several other people came over and shook hands with mrs bryant some whom she did not suppose knew who she was inquired kindly after caroline and told her they had sympathized with her in her anxiety 
and was so glad to hear that caroline was well among others came the kedwins rufus and fanny and to mrs bryant's surprise mrs kedwin herself i could hardly get away she said shaking hands with mrs bryant just near to supper time you know but i had to come down to the market and says i to myself i'll just run over and see with my own eyes that line is all right and give her a shaking maybe for scaring us all out of our senses land alive what a night it was wasn't it i didn't sleep two hours myself i kept thinking what if it was my fanny and to think it should be one of your children when you are always so careful of them and mine have to knock around almost any way i ought not to be surprised most any day if they do not come home but i should be well it isn't as if she had done anything wrong it wasn't even her fault to begin with rufus ought to have taken more care to see she was on the right train he often goes out to the junction on that train and he ought to have known all about it and kept watch i told him so when i found out by questioning him how it all was i gave him a good lecture after i found that line was safe i hadn't the heart to do it before for the poor fellow was so miserable i didn't know but it would make him sick he took it to heart worse than fanny i believe but i tell him that was because he was to blame and then the train whistled and all the people started up and tried to get out of the door at once and the train came thundering into the station with a final shriek which ben could not help thinking sounded like a cry of desperation instead of triumph and they looked up and down and right and left for caroline but no caroline appeared she is in the conductor's care remember said mr holden's reassuring voice ben if i were you i wouldn't go on the cars you do not know which one she is in the wisest way is just to stand here with eyes wide open and watch for the conductor he came presently but no caroline was with him the group pressed toward him where is caroline asked ben touching his arm the conductor turned and looked at him with a bewildered air and a slight frown and mr holden asked are you conductor brinker the man shook his head brinker only comes to the junction he said i conduct the train from there ben turned in despair then where can line be he said but at that moment another blue-coated man came hurriedly toward them and the conductor said there's brinker now he came on it seems hello brinker come this way here is a party asking for you the bryant family the man asked turning hurriedly at the sound of his name and pushing his way through the crowd to reach them yes said ben we are here where is line end of chapter nine chapter ten of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten a trying position why you see said the man which is her mother he broke off to ask this question and ben in reply silently laid his hand on his mother's arm then the conductor addressed himself to her beginning again why you see ma'am it's this way nothing has happened to her but i left her in philadelphia in philadelphia said mrs bryant and ben in the same breath and daisy said oh dear in order to understand why caroline bryant was in philadelphia when she was expected at home we will be obliged to go back to that sunday evening when she took her first walk alone in the great city she had gone out with her eyes wide open and her wits on the alert and made the one turn without mistake and presently rang the bell at the house bearing the name which had been given her the walk had not been taken without strong beatings of heart and without one or two frights for instance there was a man on the opposite side of the street who reeled from side to side in such a manner 
that she could not but think how impossible it would have been for her to have kept out of his way had she been across the road he was evidently intoxicated and caroline bryant felt more afraid of a drunken man than she thought she would be of a wild animal she quickened her steps when she saw the staggerer and broke into almost a run at last with her head behind her watching until she ran plump into the arms of a burly middle-aged man hello little girl he said in a gruff but not unkind voice don't carry so much steam on the public street give a fellow half a chance it wouldn't be a bad idea to keep your eyes before you instead of behind i beg your pardon said caroline so mortified that she forgot to be frightened and remembering even then how ashamed ben would be of her i was keeping watch of that drunken man for fear he would cross the street no danger of him he is much too drunk to think of such a thing he will keep right on until he runs against a policeman and brings up in the lock-up you will be likely to meet more of them if you are going far on this road i'll turn and go with you a piece if you are afraid oh no sir thank you said caroline hastily beginning to be afraid of him i am just at the door where i am going and she recognized the name on the door with a thrill of delight and ran breathlessly up the white steps she was admitted at once a young man motioned to her to take a seat and in answer to her eager question said the doctor would be at liberty in a few minutes and she could see him others sat about the room evidently waiting like herself somebody is sick at their house too thought caroline with a sigh how much trouble there is in the world then she thought for the hundredth time that day of her own little daisy and wondered if the waiting and the fright and the fatigue had all been too much for her perhaps she was very sick and mother was watching alone while ben went for the doctor but at this point line resolutely told herself to hush that it was foolish and wicked to make herself miserable over such thoughts borrowing trouble when there was so much real trouble in the world all about her what if that drunken man were her very own brother that would be trouble indeed a door clanged in the distance and a firm step sounded in the hall several of the waiting people arose so did caroline and a tall keen-eyed man looked in at the door whether caroline's face wore the most anxious look or whether it was because she was a little girl instead of asking who had been waiting the longest as he was in the habit of doing the doctor turned to her well my little friend he said in a quick voice what do you want caroline had carefully formulated her message and planned how to make it as brief and clear as possible so it took her but a moment to say will you come to number seventeen forty seven just as quick as you can mr brinker's children are both sick we are afraid they are going to be very sick is that conductor brinker's children sick eh i will go as soon as i can and he turned to the next waiting one caroline had evidently been dismissed but she lingered while the doctor spoke a few words rapidly with one and another turning from one he glanced in her direction and seemed surprised to see her still there you need not wait he said kindly i will be there in a very short time if you please said caroline timidly could i walk there with you i was never on the street alone in the evening before and i am afraid oh all right i will be ready in a very few minutes so you are afraid to be on the streets alone after dark he said as the door closed after them a few minutes later it isn't a bad thing for a girl like you to be afraid i wish more of our young people felt it i meet hundreds of them it seems to me who ought to be at home and in bed instead of rushing up and down the streets do you live at mr brinker's oh no sir said caroline with a quiver in her voice and before she realized it she found herself telling her pitiful little story to this strange doctor i want to know so you took a journey in spite of yourself he said 
well well that was harder for mother than it was for you i'll be bound i'm sorry for her however you will make it all right to-morrow there are harder things than that for mothers to bear see to it that you never do anything of your own accord to give her trouble and you will be all right well what have we here he said as caroline ushered him into the brinker's sitting-room caroline watched him earnestly as he questioned and cross-questioned mrs brinker all the while keeping his keen eyes on his two little patients she could not help thinking suppose she had something to conceal and this doctor were set to find it out what would have become of her his rapid questioning was soon over and he seemed to be satisfied with the result but not a word of information did he give the anxious mother he called for glasses and water gave very careful directions about the medicine and general care and in so short a time after his coming that his visit seemed almost like a dream was gone leaving only the comfort which could be found in his last words i'll look in early in the morning well said mrs brinker as the door closed after him i suppose he knows a great deal more than he did when he came but he took care that we shouldn't i do say for it that man scares me so that i never know whether i am standing on my head or my feet i wanted awfully to ask him what was the matter and i didn't dare to and that's the truth do you suppose he thinks it is anything much i am sure i don't know said caroline with a sinking heart something in the doctor's manner had made her feel that a good deal was the matter but she did not like to say so to the worried mother and indeed there was very little opportunity for talk the two babies awakened again from their brief rest one moaning as if in pain the other screaming as though he felt himself ill-treated and demanded relief caroline made herself very busy and so useful that more than once during that long anxious night mrs brinker murmured whatever i should do without you i don't know and indeed caroline could have echoed the remark she did not see how one pair of hands could have accomplished all that was necessary to be done there was little chance for sleeping and in the lulls when she might have rested the young girl was wide awake and troubled she had spent so many anxious hours over daisy that a time of sickness was a sort of education to her she remembered once when daisy had been ill the doctor's questions had been almost word for word like what this one had asked and his information as meagre from time to time mrs brinker made a remark which showed that her thoughts were going over the same ground as caroline's he asked me how long the baby had been ailing she said once and i was that scared over his manner and flurried and everything that i did not tell him right he's been fretty like for a week or more but he's teething you know and i didn't think much of that he's had a little fever a good deal of the time but they are likely to have with double teeth you don't suppose my not telling him the exact time would make any difference with the medicine do you oh no said caroline soothingly i don't think that could make a bit of difference before seven o'clock the next morning both mrs brinker and caroline had ceased to talk they did what they could and watched for the doctor when at last he came it did not need his grave face to tell even caroline that there was serious trouble i suppose you know what is the matter here he said to mrs brinker low-voiced and sympathetic no said the poor mother i don't no more than a child i never saw either of them so sick and it has come on me all of a sudden and isn't a bit like their little sick spells and i don't know what to think it is scarlet fever he said briefly and it would be simply cruelty to hide from you the fact that the disease has assumed a serious form and there is danger what the mother could have felt caroline wondered afterward of course her anxiety must have been the greater yet the girl went on the swift wings of thought back to her home and daisy their darling so frail that she had been shielded as a flower from every breath of rude wind 
how carefully they had guarded her from exposure to this dread disease caroline remembered only too well the sacrifice her mother had made to take her but a year or two before from a place of possible danger and here was she in the very jaws of the enemy which had come in so serious a form that even the doctor owned it and planning to go to her darling that very day might it not be possible that if she got away from the house now in a very few minutes it would have been too soon for her to carry danger to daisy hark what was that the doctor was saying in reply to some trembling words of the distressed mother you see madame the cases are more serious because the children have evidently been suffering from the disease for some time it probably attacked them at first in a mild form and was mistaken for an ordinary cold or for teething troubles did you not tell me last night of a slight irritation of the skin which you had noticed oh yes said the poor mother but i'm sure it was just a breaking out from those warm days we had last week don't you remember doctor it was quite hot in the middle of the day and they both break out in that way in hot weather no said the doctor with quiet positiveness it was the scarlet rash and it has disappeared when it should be on the surface that is why this little fellow is suffering so but you must keep up good courage the cases are serious but by no means hopeless i told you the worst at once because i know you are a sensible woman and want the truth then he wheeled round to caroline have you had the scarlet fever he asked she shook her head at that moment it would have been impossible to speak then of course you know the probabilities are you will have it oh dear said mrs brinker oh dear dear me not only us but we are getting other people into trouble whatever will her mother do still caroline said nothing not yet could she trust her voice and there was no telling what that dreadful lump in her throat would do if she but opened her mouth and let it have its way don't borrow trouble my friend said the doctor turning back to her with a reassuring smile there is enough trouble in the world without looking ahead for some which may never come not every one who is exposed to scarlet fever takes it by any means and the fact that this little woman has lived so long and escapes speaks well for her it was ten minutes later when the doctor had given once more the careful directions and promised to come in at evening and see if all was being done that could be that caroline followed him to the door her face almost as white as the steps on which she stood but her voice controlled doctor i have a little sister at home who is very delicate mother was told to keep her from all the diseases which people catch as long as possible and she has never had any of them better stay away from her then the doctor said promptly before she had time to put her dread question into words if it had been possible for her to have grown paler she would have done so but how can i she gasped it is home and i was going to-day my mother never meant me to come away and i never meant to and i've nowhere else and if i should be sick now you are borrowing trouble he said smiling you may not be sick i think it quite possible you will escape i can see you have a sound body capable of resisting poisoned air but did you never hear the old proverb an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure i'm prescribing the ounce of prevention for the little sister that is all as to the staying i have an idea you will be very welcome indeed in there and have opportunity to make yourself as useful as i fancy you know how to be if i am mistaken come to my house i will see that you are well cared for talk it over with your friends and i will hear your decision to-night to-night echoed caroline's white lips that is they formed as if to say the words but no sound escaped how many times had she said since daylight to-night i shall be at home the doctor three strides away from the steps turned back to say i see conductor brinker coming 
perhaps you can help explain the situation to him and save that poor mother they are a very loving family and trouble of this form presses them hard i am afraid there is a heavy trial in store for them and the doctor who was so constantly in the homes of sickness and sorrow that some people thought he had become used to them and had ceased to care drew a long sigh as he sped away but he had roused caroline from the first selfishness of her dismay what after all was her trouble compared with theirs it was only too evident that the doctor feared the worst one perhaps both of their darlings was in danger and as for her daisy she had but to stay away from her for a few weeks to save her from any possibility of contagion from this source it was caroline's quiet earnest voice which explained to conductor brinker the blow that had fallen on his home during the few short hours since he left it it was she who assured him that the doctor had said distinctly that they were by no means hopeless cases it was she who held the baby while his wife cried a few tears on his broad shoulders and who hushed daisy's wailing voice and in low whispered words comforted the child perhaps it was an hour afterwards that the conductor turned to her and said i had forgotten that you were to go with me we shall have to be getting ready it is very hard that a man must leave his wife and babies at such a time then caroline spoke as quietly as though she was not saying a tremendous thing if you please mr brinker could i stay here do you think for a few days i have been exposed to the fever you know and i'm afraid if i go home i shall have it and give it to our daisy and she is very delicate i think mother would want me to stay and go to a hospital or somewhere rather than expose daisy can you stay the conductor said with a sudden lighting up of his strong troubled face and before he could say more his wife added not an angel from heaven could be more welcome she has been that brinker all this dreadful night i don't see how i could have gotten through it without her if you will stay said the conductor it will be such a blessing as i did not believe this day could bring we'll never forget it of you never and i don't believe you will have the fever either i can't seem to feel that you will be let to have it i think mother will want me to stay said caroline her voice trembling a little this dreadful thing which she had had such trouble to speak of seemed to be decided by others i cannot tell until i hear from her just what to do but i think i ought to stay until she knows about it and this was the reason conductor brinker went westward without her and went on from the junction to explain why she was not there end of chapter ten chapter eleven of twenty minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven dark days why you see ma'am the conductor was saying to mrs bryant the trouble is just this my little ones have got the scarlet fever they have been ailing for a week and their mother thought they had bad colds and the baby teething too but it seems all the time it was the fever coming on them and they have got it bad before my train left this morning i took time to run over to the doctor's and he shook his head and says he my friend i don't know how it will go we will make as brave a fight as we can but i am an honest man and will be perfectly frank with you and tell you that there is great danger those were his very words and you may judge how a father felt to listen to them poor father said mrs bryant gently putting aside her own great anxiety in her sympathy for this troubled stranger he felt the earnest kindness of the tone and suddenly choked back and drew the back of his hand across his eyes then struggling to regain self-control he went on with his story and your caroline she thought of her little sister like the woman that she is and wrote you a note which after all will explain better than i can he dashed the tears from his eyes with one hand 
while with the other he fumbled in his vest pocket and drew forth a neatly folded sheet which mrs bryant reached for eagerly ben looked over her shoulder while she read dear darling mother what did you think had become of me and oh what will you say when you see mr brinker and me not with him dear mother i don't know what to do but it seems to me you will think i am doing right because our precious daisy must not have scarlet fever you know shall i stay mother i can help them very much i know i can and they need help they have been very kind to me i can take all the care of the one who is not sick her name is daisy don't you think and help about the others will it not be the right way to do dear mother and ben and daisy darling i need not try to tell you how hard it is for me to stay away from you when i almost ran away in the first place only people who run away from home generally want to go don't they and i'm sure i was never in a greater hurry to do anything that night than i was to get home how long ago it seems and it was only saturday night and to-day is monday oh dear mother what shall i do send me word by mr brinker whether i have done right and just what to do of course you know how it ended oh they talked about it a long time and counseled with mr holden and listened to mrs kedwin when she said impulsively that if it was her fanny she would have her come home right straight off it wasn't likely she would get the fever people often didn't and what if she did daisy might as well have it now as any time and they would feel dreadfully if line took it and died away from home folks did sometimes die with it especially if they were as old as line before they had it mrs bryant was very pale and quiet under this flow of words some of them she mercifully did not hear at all but she turned when mr holden said what we need to decide is what will it be right for caroline to do just now the consequences of right doing we must leave in the heavenly father's hands then mrs bryant smiled that language she understood so conductor brinker went back to philadelphia on the midnight train carrying with him the little old trunk that had stood on a framework made for it in the loft of the woodshed ever since daisy could remember now it was packed full with caroline's neat scant wardrobe it is well it is so small isn't it mother daisy said with a grave face as she tucked a little private bundle of her own makeup in a vacant corner we can fill it full and it will look like a great many things oh mother how strange it seems to be packing lines things and the little lips quivered pitifully it is only for a little while darling the mother said cheerfully keep up a brave heart in three weeks at the utmost i think caroline can come home unless she did not finish her sentence and turned away quickly lest daisy should see the tears how could she say unless caroline should herself take the fever if she does thought the mother firmly i must go to her whatever it costs but this thought she kept with many another one quite to herself i will not try to tell you about the weeks which followed caroline is not likely ever to forget them but then she had to live them and since we could not help her do it of what use to linger over the story bubby and the baby were both very ill indeed the hurried city doctor who never made more frequent visits than he considered absolutely necessary who indeed often offended his patients because when they wanted to see him most he sometimes decided that they could do very well without him and stayed away came twice a day regularly to the unpretentious brick house set in a row precisely like hundreds of other houses and stayed long sometimes watching the effect of some mysterious potion which he had given there were three dreadful days when he came three times and one awful night when he sat until midnight much of the time with his skilled fingers on the pulse of the suffering baby his keen eyes watching for the slightest change in his patient very little talking was done during these weeks 
mrs brinker was for the most part absorbed in her children and gave them every bit of strength she had her attempts at conversation rarely went farther than to ask how do they seem to you now or did the doctor say anything more when you went to the door with him do you think he has given up hope of baby nearly always those attempts at talk ended with the words what should i do without you i declare for it caroline i never was so sure that the lord thought about people and planned for them as i have been about this i couldn't take care of two at once as sick as they are now could i and brinker has to be away railroads must run you know just the same as ever and people must go and come if all the babies in philadelphia are dying doesn't it seem strange that folks care to go anywhere when bubby and baby are so sick what was i saying oh i don't know and can't imagine what i would have done if you hadn't stayed let alone the sick ones what would have become of daisy for daisy whenever caroline could spare time from the sick ones became her special charge she was very unlike the daisy at home but she bore the same name and the homesick girl loved her at first for that reason solely but bestowed such care and thought upon her that it ended in her loving the little girl most heartily for herself alone sometimes it seemed wonderful to her the way she had taken the little brinkers into her heart it is almost as bad as having daisy or ben sick she told herself one night with a queer little catch in her breath almost but oh dear not quite still if baby should die and i am afraid he will and then her heart would beat with great thuds there is one hour that stands out in caroline bryant's memory more keenly vivid than any other she remembers every little insignificant thing about the room the way the chairs were set and the picture book which miss webster had sent to the philadelphia daisy lying where it had fallen face downward when she left it in answer to a sudden call even the way the curtain was looped back to let in the gray dawn of the morning has photographed itself upon her memory the presentment or impression of some coming change was upon her unskilled as she was in sickness she knew that the baby was different from what he had been before whether the change was for the better or whether the dreaded end was coming she did not know she had not dared to speak a word to the mother but she felt rather than knew that the same impression was on her mind and the father had for that one morning secured a substitute and did not leave the house when the ten o'clock train sent out the usual warning whistle i'm not going out until the doctor comes he said to caroline not if there's no train leaves philadelphia today. but what will you do asked the girl with a startled look in her eyes this man who was so faithful and conscientious in regard to his duties who had left them sometimes in their tireless watch when it fairly tore his heart in two had much watching and anxiety made his steady brain lose its balance so that he did not realize the importance of his position all this was in caroline's mind while she waited the conductor glanced toward his wife to make sure she was not listening and then said i went out in the night and got changed off with a friend it is his resting time but he's going for me then you think said caroline i mean you feel and there she stopped yes he said his eyes dropping to the floor there is some change i don't know what it is and then the quick step of the doctor was heard outside and caroline stepped to open the door there was utmost stillness while he bent over baby and then he turned with a smile on his face and held out his hand to mr brinker my friend i have good news for you i believe the danger is over and then mrs brinker strong-nerved sensible woman that she was did what she had never done before in her life she fainted perhaps it was just as well that the others had to restrain their feelings and run to pick her up and give her water and fan her otherwise i do not know what might have happened we all felt so queer wrote caroline to ben that it seemed as though we could not act naturally 
and we were a little bit frightened about mrs brinker too she never faints and it lasted a good while if the baby had not raised up and cried just when he did i don't know what we should have done but the moment she heard his voice she was on her feet again and staggered over to him though she was just as white as the wall the doctor smiled and said i thought that would bring her back there is nothing like mother love over this ben looked grave mother he said after a little silence line talks exactly as though she belonged to those people and always had did you notice how she says mrs brinker never faints how does she know what she is in the habit of doing mrs bryant laughed pleasantly do you feel the least bit jealous of mrs brinker my son she asked playfully it is quite natural for young people to fall into such habits of expression at caroline's age a few days or a few weeks seem like a lifetime especially if the circumstances are such as to make deep impression i knew a young girl who said of her friend he always wears his hair that way i never saw him comb it in any other fashion and when we cross-questioned she was obliged to admit that she had seen him but three times in her life but i have not the least fear that our line will forget any of us or put the brinkers in our places can we not rejoice with those that rejoice my dear boy ben blushed a little as he said quickly i do mother i am sure i am very glad for them and for us i suppose we shall soon have line at home for line had escaped the disease it was hoped and believed yes said mrs bryant smiling brightly i think we may soon claim her now of course she could not leave while the children are so ill it would have been cruel when they took a fancy to her and would allow her to help the overburdened mother i can well imagine how helpful she has been dear girl she was always to be depended upon i scarcely knew how much until since i have had to miss her help instead of receive it i told her in my last letter to ask the doctor how soon it would be prudent for her to come and in her next i think she will be able to give us the date she could not be expected to think even of homecoming in this letter her heart was too full of joy over the babies alas for their hopes the next letter plunged ben into the depths of despair and even gentle little daisy who always tried to look on the bright side of things shed a few tears as for mrs bryant she said not a word for the first five minutes after reading the letter aloud poor daisy who it was believed had also escaped the dread disease had been taken with it and though not as yet so alarmingly ill as the others had been was still sick enough to demand constant care from her mother who was thus obliged to leave the care of bubby and the baby largely to caroline besides wrote the heavily burdened young woman daisy is very much attached to me and cries when i can't come to tell her a story before she goes to sleep she has never had anybody to tell her stories before mrs brinker says she doesn't know how and daisy has become used to them and thinks they are wonderful and so mother i cannot feel that you would want me to leave just now in fact it would not be possible unless they could get some help for of course mrs brinker cannot manage alone it is worse than it was at first because daisy was really a great deal of help with the baby i ought to stay mother oughtn't i oh dear i do not dare to tell you how dreadfully disappointed i am it sounds too selfish i know you will think so i don't think any such thing burst forth ben as he read this sentence aloud again the idea she goes on precisely as though she were bound to stay and take care of those folks it would not be possible for her to come home until they get help i call that ridiculous what would they have done if line had never gone there as she never would have done if it had not been for that idiot of a rufus kedwin i'd like to shake him this minute softly softly my son cautioned his mother while daisy looked at him in amazement she had never heard good-natured self-controlled ben go on in this way before 
well but mother don't you call that absurd what is lying to those people or they to her it was just an accident that took her there in the first place such an accident as god understood and overruled ben my boy don't you think so as for what line is to them are they not her neighbors for the present do you really think she ought to pass by on the other side when they are in their present straits i think we need line at home grumbled ben who for once had allowed self to get the upper hand and could not bring it into subjection it is almost a month since she went away over three weeks anyhow and people all asking where she is i think you need her mother as much as mrs brinker does oh no you don't my son thank god we are well and at peace and the home where she is has at least its share of trouble i think my dear boy you are tired and disappointed and hardly know what you are saying you would be ashamed of your sister if she were to desert now after all she has been through then you are really going to tell her to stay i will leave it to you i have been able to trust to your judgment in the past if after thinking it over and especially praying over it you believe i ought to tell her to come home i think i may promise to do so will you take until tomorrow morning to consider it no ma'am said ben after a silence of less than two minutes and his troubled face broke into a half ashamed smile forgive me mother i was cross and unreasonable i think i knew all the time that line ought to stay and that is what made it so hard to bear because i knew i would have to give in it was found that the doctor was decidedly of caroline's opinion she ought to stay for the present besides he added when she had gravely gone over with him the objections to her return home to each of which he had nodded assent you are exposed again to the disease you must remember and although you will probably not take it we must face the possible with brave hearts and be ready for it end of chapter 11